To discuss uh, the future of stormwater management, could you please welcome Andy Horn, Buckle, Team Leader, Asia Pacific for Spell Environmental. Thanks, Andy. Thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure and an op a good opportunity to be here today to further spread the word about stormwater. I must confess that when John asked me to speak about stormwater, I thought he was going to ask me to speak about research and development and field testing and technical stuff. But when John said, no, I want you to speak about our discussions that we've been having about the future of stormwater and how it can be managed better, I was truly excited. It's something that I've been working on for the last 10 years and um, have been forming what I'm about to show you today over the last three or four years. So before I tell you whether I think the future for stormwater is dark or whether it's bright, I just want to take a few moments to go over the properties of water and the actual issues that the industry is facing. Water in its purest form is almost invisible, it's tasteless, and it is odourless. Even though we don't think of water as a chemical, it is in fact actually a chemical. You have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom that are joined by covalent bonding. So water is truly an amazing substance, and it's something that we can't do without. It's a very precious asset. Water has a very high surface tension, that's why some bugs can walk on water. And very, very important for our social lives. Water's dense or solid form is more dense than its liquid form. That's why ice floats in your drink. Water is truly a chameleon. It is the only substance on the earth that can float around as a gas. It transforms into a liquid to support more than 70% of planet Earth. Water is fun, it is playful. Water is a very, very good servant, but it's a very bad master. Water has to be carefully managed. We think we've got plenty of water, but the facts are, is that out of the seven billion people on Earth, more than 783 million people don't have access to clean water. We actually really could call planet Earth, planet ocean, because more than 70% of Earth's surface is covered in water. Now out of all of that water, only 2.5% of it is fresh water. And most of it is in the ice caps of Antarctica and Greenland. So out of that 2.5%, only 0.75% of it is available for human consumption. So what we have is a finite resource within a closed loop. The supply is decreasing and the demand is growing. So we have to take a holistic approach to water. And as John has aptly described, stormwater is really the last frontier for the water world. John F. Kennedy said that anyone who sorts out the world's water problems is worthy of two Nobel Peace Prizes, one for peace and one for science. That's a goal that I've got. Now, stormwater infrastructure, as a generalisation, as a general rule, is the only major government infrastructure left that from concept planning through the capital works actually has no budget built in for the replacement value of that infrastructure. And mostly there's not even a maintenance budget. So let me talk about what enters the storm drain. This photo was taken by my uh, friend Craig from um, UST, and the photo was taken at Circular Quay in November last year. The fuzzy bits on the edge of the photo you can see is the, the grating of the storm drain. And in that pit, the most prominent pollution is plastic. But along with it, there's a whole bunch of organic matter, um, a little bit of hydrocarbon sheen, and a few other things. Everywhere I go, I'm looking in stormwater pits. This is not just contained to Circular Quay. So when we are constructing sites, 
we get construction or erosion sediment control runoff. When the site is built, the community generally just sees the curb inlet. And often you'll see it full of organic matter and some plastic pollution. But it goes, the water goes out of sight, it runs away, out of mind. But what is actually underneath the ground is all the stuff that went down the storm drain. It's very logical, but it's out of sight and therefore it becomes out of mind. Now, from a construction perspective, local governments are struggling to have the resource to be able to enforce compliance. This is a very common thing that I see. Um, concrete runoff water running straight down into a storm drain. If you put your hand in there and scoop it out, that's what it looks like. Now what happens is that sits there until the next rain event comes along. And it either, if the rain event happens quick enough, it flushes down into the receiving waters, or it sits there and it hardens. This photograph here shows piles of sand going straight into that storm drain. Now what happens when you get sediments going into the storm drain? With Australia's episodic rainfall, it will sit there and it will decompose and it will harden. And when you have organic matter coming in as well, it acts as a really good bonding agent. So by letting this pollution into our stormwater network, we are actually slowly but surely blocking up our pipes. We are decreasing the life cycle cost of our asset and we're greatly increasing the maintenance of the asset. And the ultimate end game is that you end up with localised flooding issues that you're forced to do something about. Now there is solutions to all of these um, issues and they're very, very effective. This is a project um, at King Street in Brisbane where there's basically a 200 micron mesh bag in all of the stormwater pits. 200 micron mesh being so it's very good with um, microplastics. And after most rain events, they are full of organic matter, plastic pollution, straws, other bits and pieces of stuff. The issue is, folks, is that maintenance costs money. And at the moment in Australia, this is seen as money down the drain. And this burden is laid firmly at the feet of local government. We are aware of this and we're sympathetic with you. Let's talk about the value of this infrastructure. Sunshine Coast City Council in Queensland. 1,500 kilometres of pipe, 66,000 pits, with a replacement value of just over $1 billion in 2012. Gosnells in Perth, 25,000 pits, 867 kilometres of pipe, with a total replacement value of over $1 billion today. We're in Victoria right now. The length of the stormwater pipes for all Victorian councils is estimated to be 35,000 kilometres, with an estimated replacement cost of $8.6 billion. And the stormwater pits, 1.4 million of them, at $2.785 billion. This is a huge amount of infrastructure, folks, that we are the custodians of. Stormwater is truly a latent potential in Australia. It has not been exploited like other first world countries have exploited it. It is also the unfortunate conveyance and storage network for organic and plastic pollution to get into our streams, rivers, lakes, reservoirs, and ultimately our bays, Moreton Bay, Port Phillip Bay. But it does provide a doorway of opportunity for improvement. This photograph was given to me by my good friend Tim Silverwood from Take Three for the Sea. Tim is an avid surfer. This photograph shows three metric tons of plastic debris taken from the ocean and put into a convention hall. This is a powerful image. Well, it was powerful to me anyway. World science tells us that every 15 seconds, there is the equivalent to three metric tons of plastic debris entering our oceans 
from land-based sources. And most of this, if not all of it, is coming from our stormwater networks. <coughs> now, you would have seen earlier this week um, on the ABC News that there was a whale washed up in Thailand and it coughed up five plastic bags. When that whale died, they opened it up and inside was 80 plastic bags. This is not uncommon. There's more examples of this I could show you. I noticed um, there was also an incident in Warrnambool with plastic nurdles all over the beach. A lot of people think that plastic pollution is a problem in Asia and a problem in India, but not in Australia. I'm really sorry to break the bad news if you think that. This photograph here is from Admiralty Island, Cairns Harbour, Great Barrier Reef. And working with Heidi from Tangaroa Blue Foundation, we are collecting plastic pollution to a protocol and we are documenting the source based off the label. Most of the product on Australian shorelines is from Australian land-based sources. It is not international. I took this photo at the, near the mouth of the Brisbane River, fishing there with my son. You can see the city cat here, a little man-made beach, and you can see the plastic just in the river wash. Looks pretty bad, hey? Let's zoom in a little closer. When I went walking up there, I got off the rocks, and I started to try and count how much plastic pollution was there. Have a close look at the picture. Manly Cove in Sydney. There's a cleanup group there that every time they snorkel and dive and walk the beach, they are picking up hundreds of plastic straws. Stormwater has to be cleaned, and there is methods to do that. However, the assets have to be maintained. How big a disaster does it take before we do something about it? We're not just talking about water quality here, folks. We're talking about conveyance and quantity. Australia is still a relatively young country. So in Europe and in America, where they are older um, organisations or institutions, they have crumbling infrastructure and they have stormwater utilities dedicated. So do we have to wait for this to happen before we do something about it? Now this is an American photo and thankfully there was no kids in the school bus. It was on the way to pick them up. But I ask you the question, what are we prepared to invest into the future of our planet? I was seriously excited and encouraged when I heard this year in April the, the a federal government in Australia had announced $50 million of seed funding for an Australian space agency. Because I thought, if that's important to the federal government, how much more important should water be? So I ask you, in an age where we have the take-up of solar and wind farms as rapidly advancing technology, we have Tesla, we have driverless cars coming online, we have drone delivery, we're getting into jetpacks, and we're trying to do intergalactic travel. Where is all of that really cool stuff made? It's all made in a factory on planet Earth, and every one of those technologies involves plastic. The thing is, is that plastic is here to stay. We have to manage it. And we've started doing a good job of banning plastic bags and using reusable drinking water bottles and coffee cups. But there's a lot more work to be done, folks. And the pollution running out of the large factories generally ends up as an EPA compliance. But in the main, the pollution is coming from the seriously urban areas, the plastic pollution. And that burden falls on local governments and they do not have the resource to ensure adequate compliance. So is there a solution? I think there is, and I would like to put that forward to you now. Before I do that, many of you may have heard of Morris Strong. I'd like to give you a quote, 
He said, after all, sustainability means running the global environment, Earth Incorporated, like a corporation, with depreciation, amortization, and maintenance accounts. In other words, keeping the asset whole rather than undermining your natural capital. In the water world, we have three legs to the stool. One is potable water, the other is sewage, and the third one is stormwater. Right now, the stormwater leg is very, very wobbly. It's time that we started treating stormwater like we treat its cousins, potable and sewer. It needs to be run like a business. This is an opportunity for local governments to get revenue back like potable and sewer. So how do we do this? In Australia at the moment, we have a certain way of thinking about stormwater. So here's your average house with the driveway and the potable water comes in and everyone says, yep, I'm prepared to pay for that service. And the sewage goes out, yes, I'm also prepared to pay for that service. It's an essential service. And the stormwater that's on my property, it's on my property, yes, I'll look after that, I'll call that mine. But as soon as it goes away, that's a public asset. It's not mine. We have to change our thinking about stormwater to think about it the same way as we think about potable and sewer. We need system-based thinking about stormwater. And this is, we're not reinventing the wheel. This has already been done in other more developed economies in Australia. So what is a stormwater utility? It is an organisational entity within council that is wholly responsible for stormwater matters. It does nothing else. It has a sustainable funding method. It doesn't rely on grants. It doesn't rely, rely on episodic funding. Stormwater needs a paycheck, just like you and I need a paycheck, and just like potable water gets a paycheck, and so does sewer. For a utility to be successful, it has to be flexible. It has to take into account your specific <coughs> catchment characteristics. And there is quite a few examples in uh, France and Germany and the United States of how multiple councils have worked together to bring their costs down and increase their revenue and their ultimate benefit to the environment and the public. And most importantly, it credits and encourages and rewards good performance. So what is the stormwater meter? Well, the motto is, the more you pave, the more you pay. The stormwater meter, the most generalized effective stormwater meter is impervious area. So the average house, let's say it's 200 square meters of impervious area. When they set up a stormwater utility, they do GIS mapping of the catchment and pick what they call the equivalent rating unit of impervious area. We're not so worried about the mums and the dads in the households, drop them in one or two buckets, small, medium and large because the real polluters are the ones that are giving all the runoff. So when we get the ERU, we then go and look at the hotel. We're standing here today in the ridges. So this hotel could be 40 equivalent rating units of mum and dad down the road in the unit or in their standalone dwelling. Now, you must give credits for good performance. And what this does is, this is incentivizing and driving low impact development. So people in the United States are now starting to design and park on a combination of permeable pavers and grass because they are lowering their impervious area. How good is that for the environment? So do you think that Bunnings can't afford to maintain this bioretention system? with all those dead wetland plants in it? Do you think that McDonald's can't afford to maintain this bioretention system? The only reason these guys aren't doing it is because there is no compliance. There is no policeman. We have a parking fine policeman. I've personally experienced that. We need a stormwater policeman. 
So what does this cost? We have to be really, really careful when we're setting up stormwater utilities. But to give you a bit of an idea, for a $1 fee, you'll get like a Suzuki Swift, sort of a stormwater utility. For a $5 fee, you'll be driving around in like a Mazda CX-9 top of the range model. How much revenue would this generate in Sydney? Well, you've got 4.7 million people. At $1 per month per ERU, you could generate 40 to $50 million annually. We can do a fair bit with that, but that's not effective enough. For $5 a month, you could generate approximately 200 to $250 million annually. You can do a lot with that sort of money. Melbourne, approximately 4.5 million people and you could generate 250 to $300 million annually. Now Melbourne is a little bit unique where you've got Melbourne Water who are already collecting a stormwater levy. And this is why I made the point about you have to be really careful when you're launching out or setting up in these programs. There needs to be very thorough planning. Because once people start paying for something, they think they're paying enough. It's really hard to go back for a second bite of the cherry. Now, this list of countries on here is wealth per capita in US dollars. According to World Bank data 2017, the top 13 countries. And when Australia is number three on the list, I'm not going to let anybody tell me that we can't afford to do this as a society. When the US, who is after us, is already doing it widespread. France, who is 12th on the list, is doing it. And Germany, who is about number 16 on the list, they were doing it first. So we are amongst the most wealthiest wealth per capita in the world. So alone, we are a drop. But together, we are an ocean. And if we're going to be effective, we need to be an ocean with a message. And that message needs to be one that resonates with the people. Because until our message from the stormwater industry and from local government resonates with the people, the politicians won't act. When it does resonate, the politicians will act. And I believe that that message is plastic pollution. This photograph shows you the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Many of you here would have heard about it. It has just recently been remapped. It is now three times the size of France. Let me put that into an Australian context for you folks. The size of that garbage patch now is 1.6 million square kilometres. The state of Queensland in Australia is 1.8 million square kilometres. Have a look at the map of Queensland and just refresh on how big Queensland is as a landmass. So here's your five major ocean guys. This black square here is where the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is. And I'm going to show you a picture of a fish that was caught about here. It's a five week old rainbow runner and inside it was 17 pieces of plastic, five weeks old and it's nowhere near the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. That was in 2008. It's now 2018. When plastic is in ambient seawater, the PCBs and the DDTs in the plastic adsorb. They form a film on the plastic. It is endocrine affecting substance. So it's going into the hormones of the fish, of the marine life that is swallowing it. Guess who eats the fish?
According to the CSIRO, there is 1,500 kilograms of plastic waste entering Australian oceans every single hour. This piece of artwork here is 1,500 kilograms of plastic waste taken from Australian beaches. The same study tells us that on any given beach, they found from thousands to 40,000 pieces of plastic. And most of it is from Australian sources. And most of it, the build up, the intensity increases around urban areas. So, I don't know about everyone here, but I have two children. Chase, my little boy, is eight, and Cherry, my girl, is 12. I don't want my kids eating plastic in their fish fingers. I'm sure you don't want yours to either, or your grandchildren. 50% of the world's oxygen comes from the ocean, 75% of the world's life is in the ocean, and 75% of beach rubbish is plastic. So would you sacrifice one cup of coffee a month, $4.55 or $5, to keep Australia's beaches clean? Or would you sacrifice more to keep the plastic out of our food chain? So where do we go from here? We are setting up, as the stormwater industry, we are setting up a task force of eminent persons to lobby both state and federal government for funding support for local governments to investigate the possibilities and benefits of stormwater utilities for their catchment. And the mission is to stem plastic pollution entering aquatic ecosystems from land-based sources for their catchment. We have to take this on step by step, piece by piece. This will also lead to assisting with other water conveyance, quantity and quality compliance. You will start to get revenue that you can use to replace these billions of dollars of infrastructure that's in the ground that currently doesn't have a replacement budget. So what do I think about the future of stormwater? I think that if we can get behind this message and empower our politicians to act, the future of stormwater in Australia is going to be brighter. It's going to be greater. Thank you very much for your time. And if you want to support us, please reach out to me. My contact details are up there. Thank you. Uh, Ilias from Maribyrn, Maribyrn Council. Um, just what you presented is pretty staggering, especially Australia. And I've been to third world countries, mm. they don't have bins. Mm. Like, why plastics goes in the ocean, but here you've got bins everywhere. Probably one question is what type of plastic? Because you've got all different types of plastic, so can we maybe investigate what type of, so we could make those? Questions? Danny from Muldura City Council. Don't I pay rates for that? Is one of the things I'd expect would come back from anyone that you tried to sell that to. Yep, really good message, but how do you sort of outweigh that? 
The simple answer is, at the moment, no, you don't pay rates for that. Because tell me this, in your rating structure and in your budgets, is money allocated to replace the stormwater network, not maintain it, actually replace it? The answer is no. And that, that's, as a general rule, that is the case. There is some exceptions. So Australia is a young country. At the moment, we are paying for this. It's an exception to the rule if we are. So this is something new. But the thing is, we're not reinventing the wheel. Um, it's been done extensively in Germany, France, and America. Um, and it's the same model as sewer or potable. We just have to start <coughs> doing it about sewer water. And the, the importance of the classic pollution message is that that is the only one that really gets the people. A lot of people don't care about sediment or nutrients, it doesn't affect them. But when you actually start demonstrating to them that truly, based on rigorous science, it is in the food chain, they shouldn't care about it. So it's got to get enough momentum so that it's not an option. Good question. I've had many conversations about this with different levels of um, politicians and activists and all walks of life over the last five years. And the first thing the politicians say is, we can't put up with rates. This is why they need the people to empower them. So there's been enough movement that they have the guts to ban plastic bags, so they're just keeping on moving into the next step. Senevi Abhikon from uh, Golden Plain Shire Council. Uh, council, uh, we have uh, uh, EPA regulation that we can't just put anything into the natural waters and we are bound by EPA regulations to uh, have gross pollution traps where I collect all these uh, plastics and things like that. So I couldn't understand how all these things go to the ocean with all these regulations and uh, uh, gross pollution traps and everything in place. Okay, if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're saying that there is gross pollutant traps in place and you can't understand how this is happening with those devices in place. There's two answers to that question. Number one, are the gross pollutant traps in your council getting regularly maintained? But is it, is it adequately regularly maintained? Because as soon as they fill up with rubbish, it goes into bypass and it all bypasses the system because it can't fit any more in there. And that King Street project I showed you, we have another one with Logan City Council at the moment. With 30, we're monitoring 33 stormwater pits with the storm sacks in the pits. After every rain event, they are full of pollution. And we're taking away anywhere between 350 to 400 kilograms of rubbish after every single rain event. So, um, and the other thing is, is every stormwater pit is not monitored. So, the average punter who just chucks his McDonald's out of his car window, it ends up down the next stormwater pit. So that's why it is still getting there because stormwater is the way it's getting into the ocean. So we have to monitor the pits. Tim Silverwood um, from Take Three for the Sea, he's a surfer, he's walking down to the beach and he just happened to see in the storm drain and just saw all the plastic there, pulled it out. That was one of the photos I put up and there was like 20 or 30 bits of plastic in there. So his motto was, take three for the sea. Just everywhere you go, if you see 10 bits, at least pick up three. So probably the long answer to your question, but what we're doing is not adequate enough. And in actual fact, the EPA, if you read the ANZEC water quality guidelines, I don't know that gross pollutants actually even come onto their, um, plastic pollution actually even comes onto the radar. It's like you've got metals, nutrients, all those other things, but gross pollutants or plastic pollution actually isn't on the radar at this point. Okay, look, can we, can we thank Andy Hornbuckle, please? Thank you.